Well, thanks so much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner. Front and center this hour, stocks at record highs, led once again by several mega cap tech names. Have you heard that before? The committee debating the markets and making some moves as well as they usually do. Joining me for the hour, Josh Brown, Jim Labenthal, and Jenny Harrington. We do check the markets, new highs, S&P and the NASDAQ. I said it's a really calm services kind of day today. Those are the stocks that are up several mega caps. So jobs report uh, better than expected, a little bit. The unemployment rate ticks up to 4.1. That's the first time above 4% in some 18 months. Rates are moving lower. Josh Brown, you've got the two-year is the lowest since April 1st. You have the 10-year at 431. Rate cut probabilities for September and December are quite healthy. The idea now that the Fed's going to cut for one reason or the other. It's either because they're confident enough that inflation's moving down to target or losing confidence that the jobs market is going to hang in there. Uh, talk to me. I think today's report uh, should give the Fed the cover they need to give us a hint at the July meeting that something's going to happen in September finally. Uh, we've been playing this parlor game for so long, I forgot when it started. Yields are down, but not a ton. The 10-year is down about seven basis points. The 20 and 30 year are down about five basis points. The one month and two month are the only yields up, but we're talking about two basis points. So not a huge reaction. It's worth pointing out, despite the 10 year coming down on softer data, it started the year at three spot eight, six percent. It's now four spot two, eight. Um, so it's up. A, uh, it's up about 42 basis points and everything is pointing to normalization. So the good news is that unemployment is still hovering just above 50-year lows. The even better news is that wage growth is cooling off at the same time that we've got continued uh, uh, new jobs being created. That's really an immaculate uh, situation. That's what none of us really believe would be possible. And here we are, month after month after month. If you look at year-over-year -year data, You've got the exact sort of wage growth cool off that you wanted, but it hasn't really done substantial damage to the labor market. And we're still printing. Uh, I think the three month rolling average is now 177,000 net new jobs each month. Now, we've had some revisions lower. Let's let's remind the audience today's number at 206 probably gets revised lower as well, but not catastrophically so. So this is the setup right now. You've got a healthy economy, wage growth cooling off. The Fed able to start cutting rates at some point later this year, and we're probably going to get the hint that they're going to do that in July. Then in August, you'll get the, uh, the Wyoming thing. Uh, somebody right, will give right, a speech right, that, that gives you even another hint. Uh, yeah. But yet, you know, we're still led by the usual suspects. When you look at today, it's comm services up better than 2% as a sector. Tech is up as well. NASDAQ 100 is good for a percent. You've got names like Salesforce and CrowdStrike doing well. But it's the Apples, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Alphabet, uh, AMD. We'll, we'll get to all these yeah. Individually, in some respects, in a bit, but yeah, we're singing the same tune. We we are, and it and it troubles me, Scott. You know, the way that I measure what you're talking about, the breadth or lack thereof in the market, is to compare the headline S and P 500, the market cap weighted S and P 500, to the equal weight S and P 500, which is a measure of the average stock performance. Now, that difference in performance year to date is 13 percentage points, round numbers. S and P by a market cap weighted index is up 16 and a half. The equal weight is up three and a half percent. And I just want to state that again. The average stock this year to date is up three and a half percent. That's actually that delta is worse than the entire year of 2023 when, Scott, you'll remember we were, and including me, hyperventilating a little bit about that uh, lack of breadth. At the end of last year, it was a 10 percentage point differential for the per, uh, full 12 months. Now we're at 13 percentage points through six months. So I am worried about it. What I think that reflects, Scott, and viewers, is, the, is what we're talking about, the weakness in the economy that's starting to show up. So far, it's just a slowdown. We've got Atlanta Fed GDP at 1.5 percent for Q2. But the worry does crop up that maybe this is a trend that's going to continue, that maybe even if the Fed cuts in September and then goes every other meeting, that it will be too late, that you might get a recession. Um, so that's what I think is being reflected in that huge differential between tech and comm services and the rest of the market. But see, we shall see. You know, Jenny's been dancing to a bit of a different tune than the rest of the market. <laughs> Still doing well, obviously, in, in the kinds of stocks that she's had, which have done pretty well. But 
the places you're looking for activity are not in the mega cap tech stocks. Now, we know why, because the kind of strategy you run, if they don't pay a dividend, they don't grow the dividend, they don't get into Jenny Harrington's portfolio. Names like UPS, though, which you've had your eye on for a while, stop waiting around. You're like, all right, let's dance. You right. bought the stock. Right. And just backing up for one sec on that, let's dance, because, Jim, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea of, of is there no breath or is there actually breath? Because if you look more broadly, right, you've got Acqui, you know, all country world and XXUS up 5%, mid cap up 5%, Dow Jones up 5%, Dow Jones select dividend, everything's up 5%. So there's, I would actually say what there's great breath. What are you talking about, breath. like on what? On, on the year, year? To date, year to date through June Yeah, 30. okay, up 5%, but that up right, 5% right. in a normal year, you'd say, oh, that's okay halfway through the year. This year? Well, Compared to the S&P and the but, NASDAQ, you say that point. stinks. You could say, okay, most of the market is in pretty good shape. It's up 5%. There's a small pocket that's let it up, but this gets back to my UPS. Oh, it's like, like glass so half I'm full, glass there. half empty. I mean, you want to spin it that way, that's fine. Well, but you could also say that those stocks that you mentioned are underperforming the market dramatically. Or you could say they're underperforming a tiny, narrow handful, and the rest is roughly the same, which gets me to UPS. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, what am I waiting for? You know, what am I waiting for? Am I waiting for the S&P 500 to crack to buy UPS? No, because the S&P 500, X those 10 stocks, is up 17.6, sorry, is up 5% with a multiple of 17.6 times. That's pretty okay for me. And the whole point of me waiting for UPS and waiting and waiting and waiting since Jan January, February of 23, was thinking if there is a huge broad market correction, this stock will get cheaper. But where it is right now, is perfect. You were, so you were hoping to get it around 132. Right. So I'm like, quib I'm like looking at myself saying, what am I quibbling with? 4%, 3%? Am I really going to sit on the sidelines hoping for a tiny sliver of the market to crack to drag down the other 492? No, the other 492 stocks out there, including UPS, are perfect, are reasonably valued. But I mean, if, so you're, if you got to be pretty pretty uh, positive on where you think the direction of the economy is going to go from here if you buy right. a stock like UPS. Right. And, and I am. And I don't think it's anything exciting, but I think it's solid. So let's get specific on UPS now. Started looking at it last year. Hey, Judge. And what we had was a stock that was now. trading Hang on, at, Josh. Going through the trade. Yeah. Trading at 20 times earnings, which is well above its historical multiple of about 15 times. You had the labor negotiations breathing down its neck, and you had a ton of distortion still from the pandemic earnings spike. So what I thought back then was, I need to see these things out of the way. And I just set it aside and followed it lightly and followed it lightly. And about two or three months ago, as the stock came under $140 a share and earnings grew, what you returned to was labor negotiations are out of the way. We figured out how to calculate those into earnings. Going forward from here, we've got earnings growth expected to be in the mid to high teens for the next 20, you know, over 25, tw over 24, and then 26 over 25. You use those earnings and you've got a stock trading at 14 times. That's pretty great with that kind of mid teens earnings growth. Even if those earnings are wrong, right? Even if they're wrong and they're 10%. I'll take a 10% earnings growth that's a 14 times multiple all day long. You've got a 4.8% dividend yield on it, which is terrific. And there's just, there's just noise out of the way. If you look at the earnings right now and you carve out the last four years, the earnings trajectory of UPS has returned to normal. So, so this is a great time to get in. And it goes to my bigger point, which is I'm not waiting for the market to crack to get in on this. I'm setting aside those top seven, top 10, which I think are skewing, we're skewing my perspective. And I'm looking at the broader market saying the broader market's up by percent fine 17 times earnings fine i don't see anything to crack the economy this gets back to our first thing i think as soon as we start to see weakness the fed put comes in so even though there is weakness in the economy and we see retail slow sales slowing a little bit what's going to happen the fed's going to cut it's going to put some money back into the consumer's pockets normal trajectory will will continue josh so brown that's you, where i am okay good stuff josh Thanks. So uh, apologies for interrupting, but I wanted to uh, say that what Jenny is saying is exactly right. We have spent the last 10 years with a lot of the there, Look, there are a lot of people who make their living in this business by constantly telling you that there's some sort of turning point at hand or that such and such um, intermarket analysis means that, you know, th there's going to be a trend change. And one of the things that they repeatedly use to make their point is they talk about these negative divergences and they constantly harp on the fact that uh, there are these bread disparities and sometimes it's small caps and sometimes it's value stocks and sometimes it's international. But the thing that they are consistently wrong about when they try to use those negative divergences to tell a story about why the S&P 500 is about to take a leg lower, 
what they keep getting wrong is that all of those major moments of divergence have resolved to the upside. So yes, you've got these leadership stocks, these large cap tech and communication services, and some dis uh, consumer discretionary. They are leaders. Every bull market has leaders. But every time we've heard people say, uh-oh, big negative divergence in the Russell, you know what ends up happening? There's a huge catch-up trade. And the industrials come back to life. And the financials and, and staples. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, remember that divergence we were worried about? Guess what? Once again, it resolved to the upside. I think Jenny's going to be dead right in what she's saying about the S&P 497. The resolution is likely to be to the upside, barring some sort of cataclysmic event, exogenous event that none of us can actually predict. So unless that happens, there's no reason to think that this divergence won't mm -hmm. also resolve to the upside with more participation and breadth improving. Well, UPS is, uh, is going up. It's uh, just taking green. We'll, we'll keep our eye there. Uh, to Josh's point, I mean, there, there are a lot of sectors that have been MIA mm -hmm. in, in this move to continued record highs. Industrials are among them, down 1.5% over the last month. Um, so it's in that mix. What do you want to say about this trade? Well, I actually, I wanted to ask her about the uh, Postal Service contract, but I think what Josh just said is more important, and I'd like to address that if I can, because I want it to be right, and I want you to be right. My portfolio is positioned that way. That sounds I more mean, interesting anyway than the Postal Service contract, so I'll, <laughs> I'll allow this to proceed. Thank no, you. Please Otherwise, tell you us are going to get mailman. rejected. <laughs> right. Big time. All right, all right, all right. Uh, but here's the thing. I mean, Josh, I, I hear what you say, and I, of course, want you to be right. My portfolio is positioned that way. But if you look at the length of time, that just to, I mean, we can take two examples. Small caps have out underperformed for, a, for years. Uh, the equal weight S&P 500 has underperformed for years, years plural. Um, what I worry about in that scenario, and again, I'm positioned for the broadening. I am. So don't think that I'm trying to say you're wrong. I'm just saying, like, this is a long time, and after a certain point in time, you worry worry about the leadership coming down the other way. There hasn't been the resolution, at least in those two meaningful sectors, for several years to the upside. Don't miss what I'm, don't miss what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not saying that there should be this expectation that small caps will catch large caps. Okay. What I'm saying is that both can go up at different rates of speed, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with a divergence where the S&P finishes the year up 15 and the Russell 1000 trails it, the Russell 2000 trails that. Um, it's, I'm not calling for any kind of parity in returns. There are structural issues as to why we should not expect that. But one thing I'm going to tell you, and Jenny will probably agree to this, even though she's not like an AI fanatic, if you think that the, the trillion dollars worth of spending in the last couple of years and the next couple of years on AI is, is being done without the intention of increased profits for every company, um, then you're missing the story. The whole purpose of all this spending on AI is that it should someday show up in the earnings of companies that have nothing to do with AI, like auto manufacturers, like retailers, like hospital REITs. This is the promise of AI. This is what all the spending is about. So in phase one, they build out the data centers. Okay, we're all making tons of money in software and chips. Phase two or three should be companies in the Russell 2000 or the value index of the S&P saying, hey guys, remember we said we were gonna do a dollar eight in 2025? Actually, it's gonna be more like a dollar 30. And you know why? We put in all these AI tools from Amazon and Microsoft, and that's why we're more profitable than ever. That's where point. the catch-up yeah. trade comes from. The mid-cap, the mid-caps are selling at 14 times earnings. The Russell is selling at 13. They shouldn't go to 20. Could they go to 16? Yeah. And you will make a lot of money if that happens. Right. Productivity, efficiency, all right. these things that you have mm -hmm. to believe at some point in a whole big swath of industries are going to be transformed because of this technology. Right, and that's where it's so interesting going to the industry conferences. Last month I went to the Midstream Energy Conference and the, Retail, and the Real Estate Investment Trust Conference, and they're all talking about it. And it's very frustrating as an investor in my space right now where 
every dollar is going into the stocks that are making money off of AI just now and today, where I'm looking at my portfolio and saying like, oh my God, everything from to Josh's point, like Sabra Healthcare, you know, and Ventos to the midstream energy companies, like they're all going to make money because of AI, but they're investing now and then they'll realize those, those profits in, I don't know, three years, five years, 10 years, but NVIDIA makes all the money here and today. I'm glad we're showing the NASDAQ here because it's extending its record highs. It's up a shy of 1%, but it seems to be gathering a little bit of steam in part because of names like Tesla, uh, talking about different sorts of transports, obviously. Uh, we could talk about Tesla because it is up 24% in a week. It's up 42% in a month. Now, year to date, it's flat. That says a lot about the six month performance. But more recently, if you want to say, well, why does the NASDAQ keep hitting record highs? Because it largely hasn't been NVIDIA that's been carrying it. It's been names like Tesla, which brings me to Bill Baruch, who's got a trade he wants to tell you about. He joins us now. I think he's on the phone. I, ha I hope you had a good fourth. So wonderful fourth. You help me out here. You bought more Tesla on Monday. This is Friday. You bought more Tesla on Monday. Now you trimmed your position by some 20%. Do I have that right? We added last week, and, and I wish you had a great fourth as well, uh, all of you there. Um, we added last week in mid-190s, and so we carried that into this week, and we brought, brought that, tail, that tailwind with the delivery and sales numbers really helped boost this thing. But we had a plan. My upper end target here was 250 in the near term. And we're sticking to that plan. I'm trimming that by 20%. I mean, it's basically has been a 30% move in just over a week for us. So I'm sticking to that plan, trimming it by 20%. Now, I, I think it could consolidate a little bit here. I'd love to see it hold out above 220. I think the sales deliveries numbers were a great piece of news. But we also learned the energy storage business hit record profit margin with faster uh, growth in the EV business. And then we also heard that locally built Teslas they appeared on the China's approved government purchase list. So there's been a number of tailwinds here. And one thing I cited, too, is that it trades like a commodity. It's been under positioned, under loved by people outside of the Tesla cult. And we're starting to see you know, a number of short covering, number of new buying. Uh, and it's really hitting people's radars. So this, this thing is alive and well now. Well, you, you certainly feel like it has some momentum back. Now, that can be fleeting. And nobody knows how long that momentum might last, but if it gets over some technical hurdles and then you have momentum to put on the back of that as well, then you're, you know, it's tough, right? You buy more recently, but then you trim some because the stock gets a little crazy over a span of a week. Absolutely. It, now, we, when we added, it brought it within our top 10 and it, it rose up to number five or number six. It's a volatile name. So I want to stick with this game plan, make sure that we weather the volatility to come. And, and you know what? If it consolidates and pulls back a little bit, there is, speaking of technicals, a big downtrend line from its record high that it broke out above at 225. So if we really consolidate out above 220 over the next couple of weeks, I'm very happy and may, may look find myself adding more back into this name. All right. I know you're pretty active and nimble in this name. You keep us up to date, please, on what you're doing uh, if you do, in Absolutely. fact, add more. We'll see what the stock does. I appreciate you calling in sharing this with our viewers. That's, that's Bill Baruch. We should focus on Amazon for a minute, too. Another record high today. That's a third week of gains. Josh doubling his position yet again in the last 10 days or so, which we told you about. The road towards getting here has been impressive, too. Kate Rooney looking at that for us on what CEO Andy Jassy has balanced, really, to get to this point, to get his stock moving to the position where we keep talking about it because it keeps hitting record highs. Yes, yeah, got another all-time high today. Investors see Jassy's biggest wins as really getting Amazon's e-commerce business back to profitability and then bulking up the advertising business, both of which have really helped lift the stock. Again, back to all-time highs. Margins in North America have been expanding after falling into negative territory during the pandemic, also a result of this major investment cycle that Amazon went through. That now appears to be paying off. And Jassy has been spending big on sports as well. You've got the NFL and NBA rights for Prime and then TV-style advertising, within Prime as well as other 
embedded ads have been widely viewed as a success by Jassy, really by Wall Street. Cloud growth, though, has had its ups and downs that surprised some investors based on Jassy's experience. He founded AWS within Amazon, and they were a first mover in cloud, but they now face a lot more competition from the likes of Microsoft and Google. They are also seeing competition in AI, which is still the big question for investors I'm talking to. Going forward, they want to see more proof that the billions that Amazon is spending in AI are going to pay off, Scott. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, Kate, thank you. What a ride, Josh, right? Um, as Jassy marks three years since becoming CEO, he, he gets the job and he's like, man, this is, this is an incredible personal achievement here to be Bezos' successor. Then he has to sit back in his chair and say, my gosh, what did, what did, what did he leave me? Um, what many suggested was at the top, and he had a lot of a work to do, which it appears he's doing. Yeah, I think that's actually, Scott, a really great encapsulation of what the last three years has been like for Amazon, the company, and its shareholders. And all of the groundwork laid by Jassy's cost-cutting and cost rationalizations and uh, str you know, strategic initiatives, all of that now is bearing fruit at the same time. It's, it's not an accident, it's not a coincidence that all of a sudden this stock is yeeting its way through 200, busting for real, for real. This is four quarters of double-digit revenue growth. Like, it's as simple as that. If you look at, the, if you look at the, the prior period, they had one quarter of double-digit year-over-year revenue growth um, over the prior six, actually. So this last four-quarter stretch is why the stock is doing what it's doing. These things are not disconnected. Stock is now at an all-time high. It's 12% above the prior high from the Bezos era in July of 2021 at the height of the pandemic, which means we have lapped all of that uh, rise and fall period. And now we're in new territory. Amazon's got an RSI of 65. I think it'll stick this week, which means it will join my list of some of the strongest stocks in the market. And it wasn't hard to see coming. I, I've been pounding my fist on the table on the technicals of what we're seeing with Amazon. Uh, pretty much all spring, I doubled my position and then doubled it again recently. And now I'm gonna hold on and see how high this thing can get. Price targets on the street are 240, 250. I don't think that's terribly unreasonable. That's like a $20 stock going to 25, happens all the time. The last thing I wanna say on this, we're gonna stop talking about Jassy and we're gonna start talking about Matt Garman. That's the next phase of this. For people who watch this company closely, Solipsky, after a tough couple of quarters for AWS growth, stepped down. Matt Garman became the new head of Amazon's AWS, which is the most important driver for the stock. He gave his first video interview to CNBC's John Fort that happened a couple of days ago. You can watch the entire thing on YouTube, the, the Fort Knox channel. If you're an investor in Amazon, I recommend you do so because what Matt Garman's going to do for, with AI at AWS is the most important part of the story if we're going to get from 200 to 250. And I highly recommend, John did an unbelievable job with that interview. We're just above 200. Uh, Fort, thanks you for the plug. By the way, you own the stock too? Yeah, uh, I'm a recent convert to the stock, having bought it in February, April, and May, mm -hmm. but I got very big in it. Um, everything Josh just said is right. I mean, this is a beautiful combination of the fundamentals, the pricing. Uh, I mean, it's 34 times forward earnings. I can, I can live with that because I think those earnings are actually higher when you take out the R&D spend. Uh, and, and the breakout, which was threatening in February when I started, but really confirmed last month. So this is one of my biggest positions now. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We have a trade alert coming up too in the energy patch. Jen is hitting the sell button on a big oil name in her book. Jim's still in it, which means we are going to debate it. And later, prepare to pay the big warning today, at least a report about what J.P. Morgan could do that could have customers a little upset. We'll explain when we come back. We do have another move from Jenny Harrington that we want to document for you today. You sold ExxonMobil. Right. Why? So this goes back to us actually selling Chevron in early 23. So you may remember in early 23, we sold our super long-term, like decade plus holding in Chevron. And what we did was we replaced it with Pioneer because what I wanted was to concentrate that part of our portfolio's energy exposure, by the way, and increase the dividend yield back then into the Permian Basin. 
Pioneer got bought by Exxon. Fast forward, here I am with Exxon, which is a great company, but it's got a 3.3% dividend yield. I don't think it has the growth that I need ahead to like justify something so low in the portfolio that has an objective of a 5% yield or better. So we sold Exxon. And we're starting to buy a new company, which it's killing me, but I can't tell you yet because we're in the middle of buying it and I've got a really tight limit on it. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm getting out of Exxon and then going back into a company with pure play Permian exposure. Okay, so it, well, we know it's in this in the uh, energy patch. Yeah, and it's Permian All right, Permian well, you tell us specific. when you can. You tell us when you can. Scott, I cannot wait to tell you. <laughs> okay, good. It's well, so our viewers cool. <laughs> can't wait either. I mean, you have a large position in Exxon. It's a very large position. I like the stock quite a bit. I mean, from a valuation point of view, it screens really well. Mm -hmm. Roughly 11 times forward earnings, as you pointed out, 3% plus dividend yield. Buys back shares like crazy, so I'm going to get a more concentrated uh, ratio of, of the earnings that are coming. And those earnings should be good. It's not just crude oil, which, by the way, very few people expected West Texas Intermediate to be in the 80s for most of this year, which is where it's been. Natural gas has been coming back. All of this while we're having concerns about the global economy, whether it's China or Europe, which continually starts and stops, and even some questions here in the U.S. Uh, but if the global global economy starts to do better than expected, I mean, this stock's going to roar. It's only about 7% off, of off of its all-time high. I'm very happy with the stock. I just wanted to keep you, Jenny, on, on commodities in general real quick before we move, we move, because copper, highest level since May. Copper's up almost 7% week to date. That's on pace for the highest level since May 17th. I just go to you because you own Rio and Freeport. Right. And so, the cop and so, by the way, Freeport's in our discipline growth strategy where there's the 5% or better free cash flow yield hurdle, and then Rio's in our international income strategy where there's a dividend yield hurdle in that. So that's why these make sense together in two different portfolios, but they're both playing copper. And everyone knows, like, as we continue to electrify, whether it's, you know, whether it's wind or EVs, like, the demand for copper is insatiable. So what we've seen this year is we've seen some rocking and rolling in the copper price. That's normal. But these holdings are very, very long term. And, I mean, we could hold them for, I don't know, a decade in the portfolio with the growth ahead for copper. Okay. So, yeah. All right. We'll check back with you in, a, you know, 10 years. See if you still got <laughs> Thanks. it. See if we still got it. I don't know. Our problem. Welcome back. Prepare to pay. That is reportedly the big warning from J.P. Morgan to its checking account customers. Our Leslie Picker is here with more at Post 9. So, this was a report. What do, what do we know about what's going on here, if anything. So, yes, as you mentioned, Scott, this is the subject of a Wall Street Journal piece this morning and something that J.P. Morgan has been warning about for months now. The subject of a slide at May's Investor Day meeting for J.P. Morgan was that, quote, proposed regulation and legislation will negatively impact the banking system and harm consumers. In recent years, the banking industry has been met with a whole host of new proposed regulations, capital restrictions with Basel III endgame, late fee caps and overdraft rules are among those that the firm says will limit access to consumers and increase the cost to those who have access. Marianne Lake, the CEO of Consumer and Community Banking at the firm, said that the pro forma impact if, big if, costs are fully passed through to consumers would include 10% fewer customers issued credit cards and at a higher APR, plus two out of every three consumers would need to pay a monthly service fee on their checking accounts. Lake said these impacts don't reflect the firm's actual strategy, Scott. They're essentially if they were to take the costs imposed by these regulations, these proposed regulations, and fully pass them through to consumers, that is what you would see. So essentially a warning shot to Washington. Any, well, speaking of Washington, <laughs> and any uh, Elizabeth Warren statements to this point regarding this report? Mm -hmm. have, have we heard anything from Senator Warren yet? I haven't seen anything from All Senator right. Warren. Well, you know where I'm going. But right. of course, yeah, there, there are indeed champions of these rules in order to protect consumers. We've seen a, an increasing uh, empowerment of the CFPB, for example, to mm -hmm. try and pursue these, these avenues. Now, the firm's backlash, and we've seen kind of unprecedented response from the banking industry to these regulations and pushing back, whether it be through lawsuits, whether it be through public campaigns. Uh, they have been successful. Success, I was going to say pretty know, successfully. With Basel III. Yeah. 
Uh, and we've heard Well, that was from, the biggie. Exactly. That was the biggie. And that's something that even would trickle down to credit cards is something that we've heard from the banking industry in the sense that they would have to reserve more against the, the cards that they, they lend out, the card um, lending that they do. And so, yes, we have seen a, a very forceful response from the banking industry as a response to this. Okay. Uh, Josh, you own JPM. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you have a specific take on this story or, or not, but earnings are at the end of next week. So I'm sure you have a take somewhere for a stock. I think the only banking stock you own. Yeah, I think JP Morgan has gotten itself into the mode where, of course, they want to deliver increasing profits, but they seem to be really highly focused on risk management. And that sort of thing might frustrate investors who want bigger, better, faster, more every time they report. But historically, it's actually been the thing that's kept J.P. Morgan standing where it is at the top of the at the top of the list of all of the financial institutions probably in the world. So this is not a story where I'm looking for J.P. Morgan to race the economy and try to outpace it. I think what I'm looking for now is just a continuation of some of the the stuff that they've been doing. Um, And I like the fact that Jamie Dimon sounds increasingly more risk averse with every passing quarter. Jenny, how come you don't own any of these? <laughs> um, so, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I- I'm also thinking about the other side of the stress test results yeah. where you had announcements from, I think, everybody or right. just about everybody of dividend increases. Looks to me like Goldman's the highest on the street in terms of a dividend at three bucks. Right, three bucks, but it's still only a 2.3% yield. So it's interesting because the thing that got closest to entering any of our portfolios was Citi earlier earlier this year when the yield crept up to 5%. And it's kind of like, you know, it doesn't, none of the big banks ever make sense for either portfolio. The free cash flow yields aren't quite high enough, including the growth prospects. Or when the dividend yields get high enough, then the growth prospects aren't quite high enough either. Something's kind of going wrong. So over the years, we've looked at PNC, we've looked at JP Morgan, we've looked at Citi, and whatever is happening at that time to either make the free cash flow yield or the dividend yield high enough, then whatever's in the background holds us at bay. And it's kind of frustrating. Um, but they just never make it in. I mean, neither of the portfolios have ever really had a big bank. Meanwhile, the international portfolio has a lot of big European banks in it. They make sense on both a growth, yield, and free cash flow level. What do you make of, like, you're hearing from an investor here, I mean, the, the banks would love to expand their shareholder base. The people like Jenny are, <laughs> yeah, like, ripe for the taking. But even she can't get around it. She's a dividend investor. Well, I think one of the big frustrations for the likes of the investor community has been just the overall uncertainty of the macro environment, the overall uncertainty of the capital markets resurgence. And so those are some things that I think would bring a lot of investors off the sidelines and into these names. That said, financials as a sector was the third best performing sector That's in right. the first half of the year. So there has been a movement toward these names uh, to the extent now where you have J.P. Morgan trading around two times uh, tangible book value. That's kind of an outlier compared to the rest of the group, but it just goes to show you that there has been a renewed excitement, uh, at least in the first half of this year. The question is whether the macro environment supports it enough to continue. I'm glad you point that out, too. Um, All right, we're back. Bitcoin on pace for its worst week in more than a year now. Our own Tanea McKeel is here at Post 9 on what is driving this big drop. It's nice to see you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Yeah, tell us what's going on. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin definitely trimming some of its losses today, but still it's taken another leg down below its 200-day moving average of about $57,000. And that is largely because of the trustee of the now defunct Mt. Gox exchange. Um, That exchange, of course, went bankrupt after a major hack 10 years ago. And they have now begun repayments to creditors, which was an expected event. So that is hitting the market now. And again, this is likely a short-term move that shouldn't fundamentally alter the more positive second-half outlook for Bitcoin. It's still got a nice 30% year-to-date gain from here. Uh, ETFs are still in demand. And then, you know, think back to how closely we've been watching the halving earlier this year in April. That was a known positive supply event. And we knew it would lower the amount of Bitcoin supply being produced. And now we have this other source of Bitcoin supply coming in and negating those positive effects from the halving. So, um, you know, this also should clear out the way for a rebound later this year in the second half. I thought it was interesting the point that our own Josh Brown made um, recently on the idea that financial advisors, in his words, in a column that he wrote or a blog, that they've caved on Bitcoin. Just the idea that financial advisors are more open to 
Bitcoin and crypto in general for their clients. And thus, if you have a bigger investor pool, you at least have more excitement and money going towards this asset class. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the ETF wrapper this year helped mm. a lot with that. Um, obviously, it depends on the type of advisor you're talking about and the type of client that they are serving. Um, it's not for everybody, but it is, you know, there's a lot going on in crypto. There's a lot of volatility in Bitcoin, depending on, you know, how far back you want to look. Because those early days were a little bit crazy, uh, Bitcoin is still here and it has been, you know, relatively stable even this year while kind of the altcoins have sold off a little bit more. All right. Well, I appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thank With you for having me. I'm Akil. Joining us here, Post 9, Final Trades are next. Got a good one to finish the week up. Take it right up to the finish with Professor Jeremy Siegel, where he thinks the market's going from here. Aswat the Motor and the Dean of Valuation. Bryn Talkington and Brian Belsky, I hope you'll join me at 3 o'clock Eastern time today on Closing Bell. Josh Brown, what's your final trade today? Amazon.com, player. <laughs> All right. Another new high. Pushing 200 bucks. Been right around there. Thank you. Jenny Harrington. Okay, RDOT, 12% yield. It's a little dicey, so don't go too big. But if there is price infl- price competition at the beverage makers, this could be a winner. Farmer Jim. Qualcomm. All right, good stuff. I'll see everybody. On hey, the everyone. Show. Welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. It is Friday, July 5th. I hope you all had a good fourth. We're going to take a look at some of the stocks that were discussed on the halftime report earlier today. We'll look at the indices, sectors, the Fab 8 stocks, including NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, all the all the big names there. We'll look at some of the stocks that were discussed on the show and some of our members' requests. All right, we'll start off, of course, as usual, by first taking a look at the markets. How did they perform? Let me just uh, reduce this in size a bit. There we go. We can see all the indices now. Uh, The Dow was up 0.17%, just barely up. NASDAQ was the biggest winner here today, up 0.90%. Okay, did not stop moving up the whole day. S&P 500, the same thing, was up 0.54. But the Russell 2000, once again, a laggard, unfortunately, it was down 0.48%. S&P 500, let's see here. Uh, Apple up 2.16, Google up 2.44, Meta was up 5.87, Walmart, Costco, a lot of the consumer defensive stocks were really were up. You can see Tesla was up again 2.08%, Amazon up 1.2, 1.22, but the energy stocks were down, pretty much all of them. NVIDIA was down 1.91%, Broadcom also, and Micron. And then we have here um, JP, you know, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and uh, Wells Fargo was down quite a bit. So what else was good? I guess the healthcare stocks did pretty good today. They were all in the green. And uh, yeah, everything else was pretty mixed. Utilities did okay too. Let's take a look at the stocks now. We'll start off with uh, the Actually, we're going to start off with the indices, the SPY ETF, right? We always start off with the SPY to see how the overall top 500 companies are doing. And um, let's make this a little bigger here. There we go. Well, once again, let's start off with the weekly chart. So it is, as you can see here, holding up above that 542, 62 level. Another bullish week for the SPY. So, oh, you know what I forgot to do? Let me just go back for one moment. I just showed you the one week performance and everything here. Let's take a look at the one week as well, since it's the end of the week here. Okay, so as you can see, things look a little different here. Um, NVIDIA was up 1.48%. Banks were up. Financials were up. You know, all these uh, big companies like Amazon, Walmart, Costco. But um, you'll notice that the medical devices, healthcare, energy, uh, utilities, basic materials, not so good. Okay, or at least mixed. All right, let's again get back to the ETF SPY. So this is the weekly chart here. We've got price above all of the moving averages. What are we looking at? The Ichimoku indicator. We're above the faster moving average, the highs and lows of the last nine periods, divided by two. That's the Tenkinson. Here's the Kijinson. We're above that one too. We're above the cloud. We've got a... ADX9 that's moving up, so the momentum is to the upside here. We had a up more volume today than we did the prior the prior trading day, which was on uh, Wednesday. So everything is looking really good for the SPY. How about the Qs? Same thing, right? Not a lot of difference here. It was up 1.04%. 
the, and you know again all of these are looking good on the weekly and the daily time frames uh, the Dow let's check the weekly first as you can see still holding up and closed above the tank and said once again on the daily time frame it was up just 0.22 percent holding up above the uh, tank and said again it's these two indices are doing much better right they're showing more strength uh, you can see that the ADX here yeah, it's moving up but it's not at the same angle um, right so and the Russell 2000 once again still staying within the Tenkinson and Kijinson here on the weekly on the daily time frame it's under the cloud so it's looking bearish basically I would not be entering a long position in the Russell at this time it's not a buy signal yet now we're going to look at the sectors let's take a look at the strongest ones and I've got them flagged here XLC which is the communication services sector look at this nice beautiful candle it was up 1.94 percent today and on the weekly chart still looking very strong financials so I did make a note here that the closing price and the Senku span a we'll have to look at the daily time frame let's look at that daily time frame um, it does because it does look good on the weekly it did close above Tankinson here for the first week because last week it was under this week it's looking bullish all right financials XLF but on the daily and on the daily time frame here's what's happened uh, it did drop right um, you know it um, you can see it, it gapped up and then dropped towards the all the way down to the tank and found some support as normal which is what can be expected the buyers stepped in they pushed it right at the closing price which is equal to so that for 4152 I'm sorry 4154 level is exactly where the sync span a is if I highlight here and you look over in this box I want you to check this area out over here you'll see 4154 under lead span a so it, it actually closed right on it my expectation is that it's still looking bullish right I would not be exiting a position obviously at this point it's above the cloud it's above the moving averages SMH still looking good in the daily right it was just up 0.04 percent today on the weekly chart looking bullish looks like it's probably making a new leg up basically uh, I made another note here let's see price hold still holding above Tengensen on the daily chart let's take a look at that yeah and I can actually remove that now we don't need that message there XLK on the weekly looking good right um, and on the daily technology right still moving up in fact you'll notice right here got above these prior highs okay whoops hold on I didn't get that I didn't make that line correctly let me fix that the high here was 232.59 there we go color that light red because it's the daily chart and we're at 232.88 just slightly above it we can see it closed above there um, so that's good for XLK XLP let's look at the weekly chart above the Tenkinson that's what you want and XLP above the cloud and moving averages the only thing with XLP though consumer staples why I probably hold off on entering a long position here the Tenkinson is still under the Kijinson all right but we did get a buy point here if you if someone wanted to have a start entering a, a short like um, like a small position in XLP you know you can't really argue against that because it's looking pretty bullish overall you can also see that the positive DI line here moved above the negative DI line but we don't have um, the ADX confirming quite yet so maybe a half position or one third position in XLP would make sense just to get you know slightly uh, into it at this point all right XLY up 0.81 percent I like that just fix that right there okay um, on the daily chart and on the weekly it broke through that 185.22 level finally and look how beautiful that that candle it just like was up all week right it did not stop and so I like that ADX is moving up for consumer discretionary all right, let's now take a look at some of the ETFs and sectors that are not, unfortunately, performing as ex well as um, I the ones I just mentioned. IBIT, that represents Bitcoin. 
So we're looking at a weekly chart here. It came down, hit some support at 32.20. Now, I did want to make a note about this. Um, when we switch it to the daily for a moment, you may have remembered on Wednesday, I mentioned, guys, once we saw that we had a spinning top here, when price you know, closes under a spinning top or even gets under, you want to start reducing your position in a trade. Plus, it got under the tangents in here. It would have made sense to do that because it then the very next day it dropped, right? It dropped about 2 point whatever, 2.21%. And then now it's dropped about 8.57. Now, an interesting thing that happened. You see this uh, pivot candle here? The low of that candle was 3220. You can see it up here in the box when I highlight it. 3220 was the low. Look where we are right now. The closing price of IBIT was 3220. This trend line was, you know, uh, I, I put this in today because I, I noticed this pivot candle. I wanted to see where exactly we were in in relation to this prior low. The fact that it, you know, the buyers, uh, you know, price gap down, but then the buyer stepped back in and brought it right to the closing price uh, tells me, like, if you happen to be, you know, long in this position, and you're thinking about exiting, all right, if it can make its way above 3220 and stay above it, then it has a high probability of continuing its way back up. But, and this is the big caveat here, if you get a, a closing price on Monday, for example, under 3220 or under this low, you may want to consider exiting your position. Technically speaking, probably should have got out right around this level. See that closing price right there? It closed under Tankinson. We had another little positive candle here, but we didn't have confirmation down below, right? And then it just, from this point, it just has been continuing to drop, and we haven't had any buy signals along the way. So, um, yeah, Bitcoin is not looking particularly good right at this time. Copper, C-O-P-X. They talked about copper a little bit today on the show. On the weekly chart, came up, found resistance at the Tankinson. The Tankinson was at 48.12, and we're still under it at 48.05. So I'd stay out of this for now. On the daily chart, we're inside the cloud, okay? Bitcoin, US dollar, you can see the price here is at 56,347. Looks like I had another trend line here on the Bitcoin. You know, this is the Bitcoin US dollar pair in Forex. All right. Now you'll see here on the low here, that low there was the 56,524.30. We have closed under it there. Okay. And you'll notice that we weren't able to get above it the very next day. We are still under it. But we developed a bullish candle. So that's why... I'd be paying attention to this candle, the high here and the low of that candle and see if price can hopefully potentially pop back up above here. Um, but it's not looking really good quite yet. And you can see also the last sell signal um, here on the Forex pair happened back on June 10th. There is a look, in my opinion, the Ichimoku indicator can help keep you out of these bad trades. If, you, if you're thinking about entering a long position, before you do that, consult it. Consult the, Throw this indicator on your charts, even if you're not using this platform that I use. Throw Ichimoku on, check to see if price is above the moving averages and above the cloud. If it isn't, there's no good reason to be entering because what that's telling you is that there's a weakness and the momentum is to the downside more than likely, especially once it gets under the cloud, like it did right there. All right, let's look at silver. Silver today was pretty bullish. It actually popped 2.30%. Here's the daily chart. We still have a Tenkinson that's under the Kijinson, so I wouldn't be entering quite yet. Uh, weekly chart, we closed above. We got a, a buy signal on the weekly. So it's really up to each trader to determine whether they wanna, you know, start edging into this um, ETF silver. How about gold? On the, let's start with a weekly chart. You can see that we closed above the Tenkinson. This is really bullish for gold. 
on the weekly chart and on the daily chart we have price above the cloud and above Tenkinson and Kijinson. We have, let's see if the, the cloud itself is still bearish here. Um, let's see about the Chiku Span. And Chiku Span is above price. As you can see, that's the Chiku Span is the white line that you see right there. Okay, that white line is closing prices. The closing price right here projected 26 periods into the past. And when you see that white line above price, that's bullish. When it's under, like it was over here, okay, you want to be not thinking about entering a long position. So we have a lot of the elements of the Ichimoku telling us that this is looking pretty good. The last thing to confirm it would be the cloud itself turning bullish when the Senku Span A turn basically crosses above the Senku Span B. That's that light colored line. You can see it crossed under here. It would be nice to see that get above. But I would probably start thinking about maybe... Um, you know, taking a small position in gold at this point because it is above the cloud. And if things go bad, you know, you can always exit your position. Right? If it, price comes back into the cloud, for example, you know, you come out. But I, what I like below here is you're getting some confirmations, right? You're getting the um, ADX moving up. That's the selling. The momentum is up. Positive DI is above negative DI. That's what we want. All right. So gold is stronger than silver in my opinion, since we don't have a Tenkinson cross yet, even though silver was up 2.30%. XHB, home builders, still dropping, right? I mean, I've been talking about this for a while now. I'd stay out of home builders. You see the weekly chart looking even more bearish here. The VIX is was up 3.23%, the volatility, but the weekly chart, you can see it's under the cloud and the moving averages on the daily it did create a bullish little candle here. We want volatility to stay under these moving averages and the cloud because these represent fear in the markets. And this is not a big thing, nothing to be too concerned about. The ADX is still moving down on this. And so there's not no true direction here. Okay. All right, let's look at bond, B-O-N-D. This is so interesting. So I've been following this and, you know, on the weekly chart, I had drawn these um, support levels and resistance. Let me get rid of this one here because there's just too many lines here. I want you to see this more clearly, the, uh, the symmetrical triangle here. <clears throat> so again, you can see there's a touch right there and there. Price touched that, this, this um, diagonal trend line here. It touched it right there and then retreated. Every time it's touched that trend line, it's dropped down. And so now, and this is a weekly um, trend line. So it's a very significant one. Over here, you can see that we have the touch right there. Two touches there. Came close here. And then it opened here, right? It pierced it a little bit, but then it closed right back at the top of that diagonal triangle. So we're getting close now, in my opinion, to a break either above or below. I think it's more than likely it's going to be a bullish um, break because we have been in such a downtrend here for so long. And, and it appears to me that, you know, this whole thing that's going on right here is more like accumulation that's taking place most likely. You know, the, the bears are probably out of this at this point. So there's a higher probability that we'll get a break next week or the week after above this trend line. And once that happens and we get a closing price above, I think that might be the beginning of the bond market starting to show some strength here. Notice how the uh, Tenkinson on the weekly chart is also moving up. So that's good. Anyway, we'll see if that you know turns out to be to become a reality or not. U.S. dollar UUP. Um, okay, this one is above the Tenkinson, above the cloud, but it dropped under $29 this week on the on the daily chart. Let's look at that. So you can see it closed under the Tenkinson on Wednesday and on Friday. And so now it's got another level of support here, the Kijinson. If you're holding the U.S. dollar, this is it. And then if you, if you don't, you know, if price gets under this, expect it to drop to the next level. 
all right, which is the top of the cloud. And then there's one last level, the bottom of the cloud. Isn't it? But I like to see weakness in the dollar because that signifies strength in the markets, basically. It gives more confirmation. How about the weekly chart on utilities? It's still under the Tangenson. I'd stay out of utilities. And then on the daily, we're inside the cloud. XLV on the daily, we broke above Kijinson, but we're still under the Tangenson. And on the weekly, we're above the moving averages still for healthcare. Industrials on the weekly chart, under, still holding in this little level here. And on the daily, we're under. Energy, under the cloud. Stay out of that for now. XLE. You can see it, it was looking kind of bullish here for a little bit where price pierced the tangents in, but it finally, finally closed under. It was down 1.56% on Friday today. Real estate, XLRE. On the weekly chart, still staying above the moving averages here, but we still have the tangents in under Kijinson. And we do have a bullish cloud, future cloud here. And the other negative thing that I'm noticing here is the Chico span is still under price on the weekly. How about the daily chart? We have a Chico span that crossed back here on Thursday, May 23rd. Okay, here's 24th and here's May 28th, where the Chico span actually got above the closing prices, right? And that's important. So that's showing bullishness. And then we also you can see right here, price is staying above Tankinson and Kijinson. So the elements on the daily chart look much better. We also have, uh, I would like to see it get above 3901 though, personally, because you can see that it, it found resistance there and there. And once we get a break above that 3901, then we'll have a, a strong uptrend because right now we do have a uh, higher low here than this low and a higher low here than that low, but we don't have a higher high yet. Right? So that's the thing I'd be watching for real estate. And then finally, XLB in the sectors. Um, on the weekly chart, it is dropping. Found support uh, at the Kijinson. And on the daily, it's under the cloud. So stay out of um, materials for now. Not looking particularly strong. All right. Let's get into the Fab 8 stocks. Now, remember, if you guys like... We're gonna, you know, we'll go through Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, Google, Apple, Tesla, Netflix, and Nvidia. If you guys like this software, very easy to get this. Um, just go to my Blue Cloud Trading homepage on YouTube. You'll see this link here, but click on this and for more links. It will bring this little page. You drop down, you scroll down a little bit. You'll see the TC2000 affiliate link here. If you click on that, you can enter your email here and download the software. Here's the pricing right there. Very quickly, just show you how much it costs. It's like $7.49 a month. Now, if you do the monthly, and that's gonna be very limited. It will just show you the charts. You won't be able to do alerts. Uh, you won't be able to do see the fundamentals, earnings, et cetera. But at least you'll be able to like play around with the charts for a bit. And the, the good thing is that when you do um, go through that link that I just provided, you'll also get a $25 coupon. So at a minimum, you can use it for a couple of months at least for free and just play around with it. See if it makes sense for you. All right. And then uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up is on that same area here where you found that link on, on the homepage. If you click on exclusive member only videos and you click this link, it will bring up another page where you can join and I typically in each you know video that I do I I um, will analyze stocks requested by our members any of the members supporter trader or legend and if you want to, to see more videos select blue cloud trader or blue cloud legend and you'll be able to access the exclusive member only videos and um, what do I talk about in these videos you can see them here in this playlist here you know, the last one was six days ago. I'm going to be doing another one this weekend. I go over over 30 stocks, some of the strongest stocks in the strongest sectors and industries. I go a little bit more into detail about entries, exits with each of those stocks. 
and keep track of them so that you guys can see, you know, how to, how my strategy works essentially a little bit more in depth, basically. All right. Now let's get back to these Fab 8 stocks. Amazon today. And let's look at the weekly chart first. You can see it's very bullish. It was up 1.22% on Friday today. Um, still looking great. I'm loving it. Microsoft on the weekly chart, very strong, up 1.47%, right? The Tenkinson is holding it up nicely here. Volume is increasing. ADX is moving up. I like that. Meta had a big day today, Five up 5.87% on the weekly chart. It broke through a prior level of resistance there, okay, these highs. That was 531.49, so now it's at 539.91. You can see that closing price was above that level there on the weekly chart. And on the daily chart, I mean, it's a big green candle on high volume with ADX moving up and the positive DI just skyrocketing, as you can see right there. So Meta is looking really good. I'm liking it. Google on the weekly chart, still looking bullish, right? Above support levels, above the moving averages. And on the daily, same thing. It was up 2.57%. Apple on the weekly chart, looking bullish again. The momentum is strong. Remember, momentum is an important thing. Don't, th you know, don't think that momentum is something that you really shouldn't be paying attention to. When momentum drops, and I'll give you a little, I'll just showcase that right now with just back testing on Apple for a moment. Um, you can see here, the ADX was moving up, 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 right? Continue to move up. Look what happened here at the top of the mountaintop where the ADX started to drop. If you look right above, boom, okay. So price dropped as a result of that. The momentum was out. It was just kind of, you know, moving sideways for the most part. We had the positive DI line cross above here. ADX was flat here, so it was a small little move up. It wasn't a long um, move there. Uh, here, with the negative DI line crossed above the positive DI line, you can see what happened there. Price dropped. When we had another crossover taking place right here, though, the positive DI line getting above the negative DI line, price got above the cloud, price got above the moving averages. Boom. Really simple stuff. Um, looking at charts makes sense because it can help you with the entry and exits. Uh, you like the company, that's great. You want to invest in the company, that's fantastic. I do too. There's certain companies I really want to be invested in. But if I notice that the, the technicals aren't confirming it, all right, then I stay out of it. I say, well, you know, just hold off and look for other opportunities. There are so many stocks that you don't have to be invested in the ones that are dropping, okay? Apple is looking good. Tesla on the weekly chart, look at this, right? To this week. Huge move up, broke above the cloud. We, um, let's see, the cloud itself is still bearish here. Do you see that Senko Span A is still under Senko Span B? It takes a little while for that to change. Um, we also have not cleared a prior high up here, that 265.13 level. So um, we're going to be coming to that level pretty soon. That's about 5.6% away. So expect a little bit of hesitation once we get there. In fact, on the daily chart, look what's happened. It's created a hammer. Now, it's a green hammer, but it is a warning signal. Nonetheless, I would be, I'm gonna circle it because I want you guys to remember that this one here could potentially, now what you need to start doing is saying, all right, let's take a look at the low here and the high. And if price can get above here, that level, the high, then you should expect a continuation. But if price closes under this low, it's probably gonna drop right back down to the, t to the moving averages. This is its equilibrium level. It's like a magnet, these moving averages. It, it always comes to it, as you can see. So it's gotten a little bit ahead of itself. Um, you can see that you can get a little early signal here with the directional movement index. See how the positive DI line has dropped a little bit? It's telling us that where we had a lot of movement here, the ADX is still strong, but the pause DI is giving us a little bit of a, a warning. And then here's another warning. See the volumes 
volume bars down below, they're not increasing, they're decreasing. So the buyers are slowing down a little bit here. They're a little, getting a little bit careful. Or there is some profit taking that's taking place up here, which would make sense after a big move like that. To you know, So would I be entering Tesla at this moment? No. It's just a little too late to the party, basically. All right. Um, yes, we have a buy signal here on the weekly, but we're getting close to a resistance level here. Um, it's looking bullish, but don't expect this thing to just go, you know, it could. Anything can happen in the markets, but I would be really cautious with Tesla at this point. And remember, this hammer, let me just show you again on the candlestick uh, pattern reference sheet. It's, um, it's also called a hanging man, all right? After a move up, you can see the bullish candles here. You get that hanging man, all right? And then what happens if price gets under, especially like I said, if the price gets under the low here, expect a downturn. And that is the candle that we have right here. Okay, Netflix. Um, let's go to the weekly chart. It's moving sideways. It's um, holding up above the 662.30. Everything still looks good. ADX is moving up. The positive DI9 is moving flat, and so is the negative DI. So it's kind of just moving sideways right now. But overall, looks good on the weekly, on the daily chart. It's gonna. It came close to a resistance level of 778. That's really close at this point. It's only 1.38%. I'd want to wait personally now or start thinking about taking some profits once it gets close to this level and then wait for a closing price above that level before re-entry. Basically, that's 778. But that's just me. Everyone has to make their decisions uh, on their own about what they're going to be doing with their trades. All right, NVIDIA. Let's look at NVIDIA for a moment because NVIDIA has, um, I wrote this note today, bearish signal today. Tenkinson closed under the Kijinson. Not on this, not on the weekly, because it is still strong on the weekly chart, but on the daily. Um, it's a little bit concerning because we did have that update on Wednesday, but then it dropped today, 1.91%. And another thing happened. Tenkinson here crossed and closed under the Kijinson, the red line, and that's a bearish signal. And um, when I highlight right there, if you look in this vicinity, conversion line and baseline, check those out. The green line is the conversion line, the Tenkinson. The red line is the Kijinson or baseline. I want you to check out the numbers. You'll see that the one the conversion says 123.45. That's the faster moving average. It crossed under, and now the 123, and then the baseline is above it at 123.85 by 40 cents. It's not a lot, but it's enough to to for me to say, you know what, I would not be entering a long position here because of that. Uh, ADX is still dropping. You know, momentum is not st to the upside yet. Better opportunities up here, guys. All right, that's all I'll say about that. Okay, CNBC. Um, am I saying that Nvidia looks like a sell signal? No, but I'd be, I would, I would be like really cautious. That's all. All right, let's look at some of the CNBC stocks that were talked about on the halftime report. Qualcomm, for example, was, um, I believe that one was recommended by Jimmy. Farmer Jim. Okay, Qcom. It closed on the weekly chart above Tenkinson again. That's good. So on the weekly chart, you're still okay to be long this position because it is above the Tenkinson here. On the daily chart, we had a crossover, negative crossover. Now, this could turn around, obviously. It looks like price found some support at 193.58 right there. And so will this lead to a move back up? On the Tenkinson price did close above the Tenkinson here. It's, it's There's no buy point here. I would just be um, holding off on QCOM for sure. UPS on the weekly chart, under the cloud, under the moving averages. It's um, coming to, I mean, it's, it looks like there is some support down here. You can see that. This might create a double bottom possibly, you know. However, 
it's on, you know, is that, is that a reason to be entering a long position? No, we're still under the moving averages in the cloud. XOM, another one. Oh, let me, I just forgot to look at the daily there. Let's go to the daily. And on the daily chart, we have a crossover. Tankinson crossed above the Keijans, and that's a bullish sign. But again, um, you're not, it's not a time to be entering. We're still under the moving Tankinson here. We're still under the Keijinson. We're still under the cloud. You get a cheek span that's under price here. And you have a bearish cloud. All of those things tell you, stay out. It's not ready for a long position. XOM was talked about. Exxon Mobil. I this one looks bearish on the weekly chart. And and uh she mentioned, I think it was um Jenny, she mentioned that she exited this position recently. So that that was a smart thing. Um, because as you can see, price closed under the tank it's in here this week. That's a good time to exit right here with Exxon if you're holding it. Another place where you it would have made sense sense to exit was right on I'll show you this candle. Why do I say that? You can see this. See this pivot candle? This is a shooting star, right? And the shooting star candle is a very powerful candle. It can lead to a drop. Again, let me show you what that shooting star looks like on the pattern reference sheet. It's a single candle pattern. It's bearish. And this is what it looks like. After a move up, you get that long wick. Here's what it represents essentially is that the buyers continue to push this up that week or that day, whatever time frame you're looking at. But then the, the sellers, the bears pushed it right back down. And then the very next, now what you have to start looking at once you get that warning candle is where does price go the very next day? Does it close under that level, the low? Yes, get out. If it's if it continue if it gets above and continues, then you can cancel that out. It was a false signal. You don't have to worry about it. You're not not all of these are going to materialize. You're going to get some false signals. That was not a false signal. That was a real signal. Uh, so the Japanese candlesticks should be utilized in addition to the Ichimoku, and you shouldn't just be exiting necessarily when price closes under the Tenkinsen. Uh, you should be looking at the candlesticks as well. And if you see price closing under Especially when price is uh, as far up above the Tankinson, as you can see right there, there's a big move up, right? There's a lot of air here. Um, when price closed under, it made sense to exit right there. And then we really didn't have, even though price, we got a bullish candle here and everything else, uh, and we got close to the Tankinson, we didn't really have a, a new buy signal in my opinion, because if you look down below, you'll notice that the ADX was dropping at that point. Right, so it was looking bearish. Volume was dropping. Um, we had resistance up above here. It was you know you would have wanted to get above the high of one twenty three ninety basically. So right now, you know, last week, XOM was looking good. Now we're getting another sell signal on the weekly chart. So where we had a buy signal before, it's telling us watch out next week. Okay, and on the daily time frame, we haven't had a buy signal since. When, did, when was the last buy signal? On the daily chart, I suppose you could have said, um, again, here, right, where price closed above the Tenkinson and was above the moving averages. But if you, again, if you look down below, you'll notice that ADX was dropping. It wouldn't have been an ideal time to, act, to enter a long position. Whereas, if we go back a little bit, notice how the ADX was moving up here. Price had gotten above Here's an optimal entry point right there. Price closed above the cloud, right? Price closed above Tenkinson. Price closed above the Kijinson. And the ADX was moving up at this point, And it led to a nice move up. All right, let's look at AMBP. This is, um, I think that was, let me see. That was Jenny's uh, last pick at the end of the day. The end of the show, I'm sorry. Um, I would stay out of this one. Okay, let me just look at the weekly first. Ooh, Jesus. Why would you, <laughs> why would she recommend this stock? Only because she's trying to get out of it. That's the only reason. Um, AMBP, Consumer Cyclical Sector, Packaging and Containers. Let's take a look at the, uh, I'm just curious to see this on Finviz. Let's get a little more info on it. 
All right, AMBP. Remember, FinViz is a great way to do a little further analysis and to find out how the stock has been performing. You can see the profit margin is negative 1.27% here. Performance year to date down 11.46%. Their sales are $4.82 billion, but their income is negative $61 million. Yikes. And um, has not been performing well at all. I don't like it. Let's continue. Let's go down a little bit. Let's find out a little bit more about this company. I'm just curious. Um, they're based out of Luxembourg, it looks like here. AMBP. Um, let's see. It's a $3.44 stock. Yikes. Yeah, that's, 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 you're playing with fire here. The only, what's this say here? Um, dividend is increasing 11.78%, but it's only at a 0 0.40. Yeah, I don't like this stock at all. Um, engages in the development, manufacturing, and sale of metal beverage cans. It also offers related technical customer service. It operates through the Europe and America's geographical segment. The company was founded in January 20th of 2021, headquartered in Luxembourg. Um, but then again, this is why the charts can, you know, if there's an interest in this company, there's the negative profit margin there. If there's an interest in this company, you're going to see it on the charts. All right. And there's no interest here. Price came right back. It was, uh, it, there might be some accumulation that's taking place down here in this level. But until you get above the cloud on the weekly chart and you start seeing some profits in the company, I would stay out of it. All right. Let's take a look at some of the member uh, requests. Members requests. H-E-W-J. This is the iShares currency hedged Japan ETF. H-E-W-J. On the weekly chart, very strong. I like the technicals here. Looks good. It was up just 0.29%. The beta is 0.69. That means it doesn't really move that much in comparison to the S&P 500. So it's not going to have big moves, right? On the daily chart, just moving up. It's not a very high volume traded stock. So, you know, if you're thinking, of, if you want to be invested in, you know, uh, in Japan and in ge just in general, uh, see the house of 71,000 trades. That's not a whole lot, which means that it's going to have, um, it's not liquid. And, uh, what you'll find is a big gap between the asking price right here and the bid price. Never really showed you guys this before, but see that 4013 level and the 4450, that's how much of a slippage. It's a, it's a huge, you know, difference here. Uh, in the uh, in, in the stock in this specific ETF, so let's look at another one. EWJ, for example, I know off the top of my head, you'll notice that this one is a little bit more liquid. It has 6.7 million shares traded per day. You'll notice that the slippage is smaller. 69.61 versus 69.96 is the asking price. There's the bid price. All right, um, so. If I was going to enter a long position, I'd be thinking of this ETF over the other one personally. All right, let's, and this one here is on the weekly chart. Looks good too. As you can see here, we have a buy point on the weekly chart from last week. And on the daily chart, it broke above on Wednesday, July 3rd here, above the cloud. Everything looks really bullish. It does have a reversal candle. You have to start watching out now, okay? Because when you get one of these hammers, that can be very dangerous. And so I'd be putting a stop probably under the low of that candle, which is 69.57 for this ETF. And for EW, HEWJ, the low there is uh, 44.35. So I'd be very cautious. Hopefully you've made some nice, nice profit in this one, but just be really cautious with this at this point. <clears throat> Here's another request. This is Mitsubishi Electric Corporation, ticker symbol M-I-E-L-Y. Um, as you can see, it has shown some strength here these last couple of weeks, right? We have a bullish hammer and it popped and closed above the Kijinson here, but it still needs to get above the Tankinson uh, first. And uh, all the other elements of the Ichimoku are looking good technically here. The, also, you'll notice that the um, 
momentum is not really strong right now. The momentum is dropping, the ADX on the weekly chart. How about the daily? Okay, daily chart. We are, and by the way, this is another stock that has very low average volume. And um, it's 40,000 shares traded per day. So, you, you know, do you see how the candles just kind of gap up quite a bit? So you want to stay away from, personally, this is my opinion, stay away from these really low volume stocks or ETFs because, you know, you're going to have, you, you're going to have um, just these types of crazy moves up and down all over the place. It's just a lot of chaos. And so, and right now, technically speaking, as you can see uh, from the daily perspective, uh, I would not be entering a long position because it's under the cloud. Uh, but it has been moving up, but it, it's found some resistance. And we have a, the last candle here was a red candle, even though it was up 3.76%. All right. And I, I just wanted to mention that one of our um, subscribers was asking about um, whether or not there were mutual funds for T. Rowe Price. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many mutual funds within uh, TC2000. So, you know, here's PRCIX, for example on the weekly chart. Here's uh, PRGTX, Global Technology Fund, looking pretty good here. Um, and here's PRWAX. So, you know, if you invest in mutual funds instead of individual stocks or indices, this is a good way to track them. You know, if you notice, for example, that they start looking weak on the, on the I would I'd probably use the weekly or monthly charts here to determine whether or not to enter uh, a mutual fund. So for example, perfect example, should you always be invested in the markets? No, here's, an, here's a perfect example. You had a nice buy point here, a nice sell signal here. If you entered on this position on April 30th, 2020, and you exited right there, you'd make 